Welcome to Libertarian Crusaders, episode number 37. And today we have, uh, I say Bitcoin guru and all things uh, crypto uh, and all things uh, well, experiencing Marxism firsthand and communist uh, USSR, uh, Michael Tozzoni. And I want to th thank you for your time coming on the show. Uh, we've been great friends for a good long time. And last year, you at Anarchon, uh, you brought the story that I think a lot of people need to hear. Uh, we should have probably done this when Netflix was talking about Chernobyl, but you yourself, uh, you know, have experienced what it's like not just to escape from Russia, I mean, from, from communism, but from a nuclear disaster. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself um, and uh, what brought you to the U.S., I guess, in the, from that experience? Uh, well, I'm Michael Tazani. I'm uh, better known online as Rasa. I'm uh, basically a crypto investor, entrepreneur. I've I've run, done crypto mining. I've done crypto development. I've run crypto businesses. I have a Bitcoin ATM. I'm running it up, setting some more of them up. And I'm just an entrepreneur in general who has like uh, properties, businesses, stuff like that. Uh, as for why I left USSR, I was 10 at the time. My parents were the ones who got it, my brother and myself and then the rest of my family out. And we left because, uh, well, communism. We uh, wanted to have something a little better. And while you live completely submerged in the whole communist propaganda, a lot of people don't really get what's going on. But luckily, my parents did. And since we did have some family from outside the U.S., we kind of uh, got a, well, we got a feeling of what it's supposed to be outside. And also, we were kind of sort of um, on watch lists and being kind of persecuted. So we kind of had to, uh, we knew it wasn't that good inside either. So were your parents entrepreneurs while they were over there or how could they have an insight like that? All right. They had an insight just because my um, step uncle moved to us when he was uh, younger and uh, it wasn't entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship was illegal in uh, Soviet Union. It was, um, well, uh, we just knew what life was like in the U.S. and we got to compare it to what we had back there and um, that was it. <clears throat> I mean, I can give you some ideas of what it was like in there. Like uh, we had, when we had toilet paper, the only very option we had was, you know, the brown paper bag stuff that you guys have here. Uh, imagine that just a little Russia bit <laughs> The brown paper, yeah, like, you know how if you look really closely at the paper, the brown ones or something, see the little witch pulp and stuff in there. That's basically what we had. Um, we had, uh, like, the grocery stores where basically you have your option of potato, your option of bread, your option of milk, your option of egg, I guess. Uh, when you wanted to go to a fish market to buy fish, fish would come in these giant, like, you know, big, uh, blocks of ice where all the fish would basically come factored into that ice and you say I want a kilogram of fish <laughs> so I would take out a hammer and a chisel and knock out a kilogram of frozen fish chunks for you and there you go uh, we did have rarely like uh, canned fish and stuff but uh, it was rare and yeah those things about having to line up like we would uh, sometimes hear about meat being delivered to a local market so we'd have to line up at um, you know, 6 a.m. or something in order to get to the market to be able to get it first uh, when it's actually available. But yeah, it was, um, it was not good. You know, Bernie, you know, good. Bernie Sanders once said, um, <laughs> you know, bread lines, bread lines are good. <laughs> that means everybody's getting all the food that they want. And um, right. he, you know, his people would point that out to him. They'd be like, wow, look at all these Marxist countries where people have to wait in line for bread. And we have just racks of bread available for people to buy. So what is your, how do you relate to what Bernie is, is describing there? Uh, I mean, he's an idiot. Obviously he doesn't <laughs> understand economics. There's actually kind of an old Western anecdote that um, one guy, uh, I've, some Soviet leaders telling the other guy, like when Soviet Union succeeds and utopia, we have the utopia then, 
uh, everybody will have their own airplane. And the guy asked, why do everybody need their own airplane? It's like, well, if your local food market has a lot of meat and you know that the uh, food market at the other town has meat, you can fly over there and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> and the communists here are ringing about trucks driving stuff cross country. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was terrible. I mean, like they're talking about how, um, we ran out of toilet paper for a while because for some dumbass reason, everybody started wanting to buy toilet paper with the virus. And they're saying, how does it feel like living in communism? It's like, eh, this isn't communism. I mean, yeah, it's like you don't have toilet paper. So you hop on Amazon and buy yourself a day or something even better. Right. It's kind of like when people complain about the border and they said, look, it's just like the Holocaust. And then, you know, they take him back to their country. It's like, yes, just like the Holocaust. <laughs> um, right. what, what John was mentioning about uh, Bernie Sanders, there was a comment where he made not that long ago. He talks about you don't necessarily necessarily need a choice of 23 underarm spray deodorants or of 18 different pairs of sneakers when children are hungry in this country. All right. I like, I like my steel toe boots because, you know, I work for a living. Well, you like. There's children starving. You don't need that many variety, Kurt. You just need one boot. Does God forbid my toes. Crush them right off there. I kind of like how people complain how we are throwing away so much food. Capital is horrible because, uh, you know, millions of pounds of food get thrown away every year instead of being thrown away. Like, yeah, capitalism is so good that we're actually able to produce millions of pounds of food that nobody even wants. Right. Kind of looking a little backwards. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us, a little, uh, yeah. I was gonna say, tell us a little bit about your great escape and how you're not glowing radioactively right now, all fluorescent green. Uh, so my grandfather was uh, lucky for us. Um, actually, my grandfather has an entire, um, entire story too. My family, originally we were royals. Uh, we were counts. Um, Lucky for us, we managed to. Um, one of my great, great, great couple of great grandfathers or whatever um, ended up blowing our, our entire fortune, family fortune, on basically hookers and gambling. So we went for, and we have a bunch of this kind of stuff. Another guy was hated so much, he was poisoned by his cook, but whatever. We used to have a lot of land and kind of a palace type of thing, but after that guy blew all of our money, we ended up with uh, not that much left. Uh, so as a result, when the whole pogrom thing happened, we kind of were left alone because we were not, well, kind of. Uh, they did end up seizing my grandmother's uh, house and turning it into a kindergarten. And my... Uh, my grandfather ended up having his whole family lined up against the wall and shot when he was 11 uh, in front of him. But on the other hand, they did not exterminate us completely and did not really go after us completely. They left my grandfather, my grandfather and his grandmother alone. Um, but over time, he did end up... Uh, uh, he did end up getting an education where they figured that he was more valuable as a scientist than as a dead person, even though they were pursuing him most of his life. So they ended up hiring him and to a couple of institutes, and eventually he ended up becoming the head of the Soviet Polytechnical Institute, which is basically the Soviet version of DARPA, uh, because of him, was the head scientist there anyway. Because of him having that connection, uh, when Chernobyl blew up, they were notified about that right away in order to, well, try to figure out what to do with it. And they also were able to test for their Geiger counters. Uh, that, uh, the street that they lived in, it's uh, called like uh, Science Avenue would be the literal translation. It has uh, the Polytechnical Institute. There's, uh, I believe, a Agricultural Institute and a uh, Atomic Research Institute on that street. So like, imagine you are... Um, May, like downtown DC and there's this big street and right on that street there are these kind of big office buildings that are doing like super dangerous atomic research right in that building next to everybody so people living in that neighborhood also have um, like Geiger counters just to because they know nobody's going to tell anybody anything but in case there's an accidental release sometimes they're like oh shit this thing's going off okay everybody stay indoors for a bit 
but uh, he was able to find out about Chernobyl on the day that it blew up and told my parents about that. So as soon as they found that out, they took my brother and myself, put, him on, put us on um, kind of a little cargo postal plane, one of those little twin engine pieces of crap that uh, I still remember what it was, it took off and then bounced a little bit, landed and took off and bounced a little, landed and took off and finally kept going. One of those like old timey movie kind of thing. It's not like now where you just go. And we flew, they flew us over to my grandmother who lives way, way, way out west. Uh, and themselves, they basically had to stay in Chernobyl. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they were telling everybody, all the neighbors who lived in the 10 story apartment, like Chernobyl is burning, get out, you know, do something. Chernobyl is burning. Nobody believed them because the government didn't tell anybody. <clears throat> and I think this happened a day or two before uh, May Day, which is uh, some big kind of a celebration where they have parades, like public parades and public celebrations, barbecues. Nobody knew about it. Uh, so we were out. Uh, Chernobyl fallout was falling on everybody and nobody knew about it that happening until about, uh, I don't remember if it was three days later, five days later, a week later. Uh, so we were safe, other people not so much. Um, a couple of our friends were out barbecuing and ended, ended up getting, like uh, their kid got radiation poisoning, a bunch of kids and a bunch of people who are adults now ended up having uh, pituitary gland problems and other cancers and other stuff later on. So there you go. I'm curious. Um, I mean, as you're saying all this, I'm thinking immediately about the HBO special on Chernobyl because it was real. I thought it was really good, having not experienced any of it. But you, ha- knowing people who live there and knowing the you know the story personally, what did you think of that? You mean the uh, six episode miniseries? Right. I, yeah. I don't know if you saw it or not. I, I shouldn't. Have I, I keep forgetting to watch the very last episode. Uh, overall, yeah, it's uh, it was pretty accurate. Like uh, we were, um, most of us didn't know about any of that stuff that was happening. Uh, there was some stuff that the main thing that it taught me actually is like for us, what happened was we knew about Chernobyl. We flew out to my grandmother's. <clears throat> Sorry, we stayed there for about most of the summer, and then because this happened in uh, late spring. And then we had to go back for uh, the fall because we had to go back to school. And in fall, uh, it was the issue was that all this fallout ended up falling on the leaves of the trees. So the radiation was pretty low, but then when leaves started falling again, all the dust started coming back down to the ground. So once again, um, radiation shot up and everybody had to, like our parents were telling all our kids, like, don't, uh, don't play outside. As soon as school is over, walk straight home, keep your windows closed because it's radioactive out there. <clears throat> but with regarding them to the mini series, I mean, I, I learned about most of that stuff that was happening much later after we came here because all of that information that I've been leaked out uh, and disclosed as well. What the series really told, taught me was uh, the timeline of what, when all of this was happening, because, like we knew there was an issue that um, if this radioactive meltdown ends up hitting the uh, the water under the reactor, we can have an explosion similar to a dirty H bomb and like wipe out most of Europe. We knew that uh, if it continues to melt down, it could actually end up hitting uh, the underground rivers that's built under Chernobyl. And if it was to go into that, that it would end up. Um, poisoning the Mediterranean Sea and then from there the oceans as well, which would really mess things up. Uh, what we didn't know is that it was that while I was going out to school, all of this stuff was actually happening in the background that we weren't actually being told about. Like the, when they were digging those tunnels underneath, was everybody working naked because it was too hot to work and the fans were there? That was happening while I was going to school. I did not know about that stuff. Wow. So, yeah. But the series was, uh, I thought it was fairly accurate. Uh, there were some uh disputes i guess with regards to the the guy was contaminated and then um like he was in a hospital and his mom went to see him and then she ended up being contaminated and the baby died or something uh there was disputes about whether radiation does get spread that way i generally not like if you are uh, if you get radiation sickness to that level i mean the comments was that you are not really radioactive, so you're not going to kill somebody just by ha- them having to talk to you. Uh, but I 
don't really know exactly how accurate that is because like generally you think no, but uh, we do end up having to bury those kind of people in lead coffins because they are still not safe to be around. Uh, my guess is what would have happened with that lady is that she may have been just one of the people in Kiev or one of the people living a lot closer to where Chernobyl was. Or, I mean, that was basically dramatization. Sure. Regarding where I'm from, by the way, I'm from Kiev, which was the capital of Ukraine, and Kiev is 60 miles south of Chernobyl. So uh, for people living here, imagine like you live in D.C., Chernobyl would be about Baltimore. Or if you live in um, where you are in... Uh, uh, RVA, whatever, Richmond, Virginia, uh, the Chernobyl would be kind of, I guess, similar to uh, DC, I guess. So it's pretty close. <clears throat> Your uh, parents tell you why you're going on a magic airplane ride out of the town? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, uh, they, I mean, I, I was too young to really fully understand, but they told me that there's a, a nuclear accident and it's really not, it's really dangerous to live be back in Kiev, so we're going to send you on vacation to stay with grandma for a while. Right. You never suspected it was the uh, CIA? Because uh, right after the series came out here uh, from Netflix, there's a pro Kremlin Russian TV network that's going to air their own version that has the CIA sabotaging Chernobyl <laughs> and causing all this radiation fallout. No. Um, after all that happened, they were pretty open about what actually happened. They, um, I mean, they, the entire series of events and what actually happened and what caused the issue is pretty well known. I mean, they, we know that they were doing a series of tests. We know what those tests were. We know what they were, where we were, we know what they were supposed to do. We know what jammed. Um, we know what made them think what was working when it was actually not working. When you like, all of it was basically known. It's basically that they're trying to uh, see if the safeties will work when they drain the water too much, and uh, the test showed them that the safeties did not work, basically. So they tested to see uh, whether catastrophic failure would be stopped, and catastrophic failure was not stopped. So it's like, let's see if this wing on this airplane works while we're flying. It's shaking until it breaks. Yep, it broke. <laughs> Yeah, that was dumb. <laughs> Would you say today? But they were also uh, really, really badly designed reactors. Uh, for anybody who's concerned about this kind of stuff happening in the U.S. or, uh, or elsewhere, uh, U.S. reactors are not going to do that kind of stuff. Uh, the reactors built in Chernobyl were specifically designed to make nuclear material for bombs. Uh, the reactors in the U.S. are not quite that bad, no. Capitalism. Uh, I'm actually pro nuclear. I'm very pro nuclear, and I wish we nice. would get uh, regs out of the way. So you we need can to sell your services. Nuclear. You need to be like, as a citizen who had to flee Chernobyl, I support nuclear energy, and you know, you could make <laughs> some good marketing dollars. I guess. I, don't know. I mean, a lot of us from Chernobyl uh, areas, uh, from Kiev and stuff, support nuclear. But um, I mean, dumb people. You, uh, I've long since decided that uh, I, uh, it's useless to argue with people who have who are convinced in certain things. Like the entire uh, COVID-19 thing, people made up their minds about whether it's dangerous or not they, back in like April. And now at this point, it's just everybody sharing whatever is their agenda. So who cares? Right. And, and speaking of people who have uh, made up their minds, uh, can you speak a little bit to your maybe surprise findings to see Marxism still proliferating here in the U.S. after having just <laughs> having to escape such a place of uh, Marxist uh, utopia? Uh, well, I mean, with regards to Marxism, the two stories that I kind of stick out in my mind, one was... Um, in our neighborhood, there was a couple who and who was baking really, really tasty pierogies. So they decided to um, try to kind of share with the rest of the people in our neighborhood. My neighborhood, by the way, is like downtown Metropolis. You know, ten-story building apartments, kind of the projects, kind of area. So they bought some ingredients. I got a little area to set up as a shop, and they were selling pierogies. 
it, it, there were other places like the official restaurants that you go to where you can buy them, but they were selling these, these guys are selling them for a little bit more. And they were obviously very well made because they were not like government created, mass produced, whatever. And then unfortunately, um, about a month or whatever after they started, they were disappeared because that kind of entrepreneurship is illegal. Uh, I also remember um, my best friend and I found some money and we managed to, uh, somebody lost some cash in a place. Uh, things are cheap in the USSR when I lived there, give you an, an idea. Uh, metro ticket is five cents or whatever we call the equivalent of cents. Uh, bread was about 20 cents. Um, but at the same time, my parents' combined income highest was about three hundred dollars a month. Uh, the average is about uh, I don't know one hundred and fifty, maybe two hundred. Funniest thing is, right now, average income in Russia and Ukraine is still about three hundred dollars a month. <clears throat> um, but we found some money, so what we did, we spent it on was uh, chocolate because even though candies were. Uh, available. It was very rare for us to get any of those. Uh, that would be kind of a thing that some, like when you go to visit guests for some dinner party, they would have candy. For us as kids, it's like, holy shit, we can actually buy some chocolate. So we bought what's called chocolate. It was, uh, imagine a clear plastic bag with, uh, you know how if you leave uh, regular chocolate out for a long time, it starts, it gets covered in this white powder because it dried out and stuff. Kind of imagine that kind of stuff, consistency of, uh, you know, greasy fudge, and that was our chocolate. And it was such a, um, such a treasured thing that we actually ended up hiding in some place so we can eat a little bit of once in a while. And that was our communism growing up as kids. My Even parents, by the way, um, yeah. I was just going to ask real quick, uh, the what year do you think that was that that family was disappeared for making pierogies? That you know, uh, eighty. 788, 89, late, mid to late 80s. Because that's, you know, that's Glasnost, right? I mean, that's like uh, after um, he... Yeah, that's Peter Stryka, right? R- yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, imagine growing up and keeping in mind that you do not own anything at all. Nothing that you have, nothing in your house, none of it's yours. It's all government property. Whatever you buy was is owned by the government. So... Uh, your house is government housing, your food is government food. You, It's not money that you have, it's, I guess, like tokens that let you give permission to trade what you had through your labor for something else, which I guess technically what money is as well, but um, you, know, you have some labor and the government allows you to have some food or some clothing or something else. So yeah. With what's going on right now is Marxism. I mean, most people who support this stuff don't really understand what the hell it is. Like there was a poll uh, done a while ago that showed that something like, um, I don't remember, like about 60% of young people support socialism. And then 40% of those people, uh, of all people don't know what socialism actually means. So I suspect it's kind of the same deal. Uh, they, Marxism is... I consider it kind of as a uh, intellectual virus where it's a really nice sounding idea. The problem is that it, it kind of sounds great because, you know, you get, you contribute to society and society takes care of you. So, you know, I, who wouldn't want society to take care of them? Like I want food and I want shelter. All I have to do is contribute something and I'll have food and shelter and all the food and shelter that I want. Unfortunately, uh, Marxism ignores, um, that different types of contributions have different values and obviously it ignores uh, scarcity. Well, the main thing it ignores is uh, unlimited needs or unlimited wants versus limited scarcity uh, or limited supply. So um, any way you solve for that is you start rationing stuff. So everybody believes that Marxism is great because they will contribute stuff and they'll get great housing and uh, all the food that they want, but they'll end up with uh, really shitty government housing and, you know, here's your choice of potato, here's your one potato, a a apple, a tomato, a uh, egg, a bread. So, yeah. It's funny because sometimes uh, the people that advocate for them are usually the ones that uh, think that they're they're the ones who are going to be in charge. They're the ones who are going to live like in, in the White House, for example. Uh, oh, yeah. The people's commons, yeah. the barracks, and the people's food. 
Yeah, I love that uh, 4chan text of somebody, the meme that somebody shared where they think that they, in their middle class family, will be the ones who will be in charge. And then Cletus and Jamal will show up to their door with guns demanding they give up all their stuff and move like four homeless people into their house or some shit. Right. But yeah, obviously. Uh, the other thing that uh, I recently, I mean, I've been thinking about this Marxism of stuff and actually... I guess one benefit of what's going on with Marxism, it makes you think about what's going on with it. Marxism as an economy or economic policy obviously fails. We know that it fails because it doesn't have a price discovery mechanism. Um, Anybody wondering why Marxism fails, just look up what uh, the price discovery mechanism is and you'll understand why it doesn't work. It failed in the USSR so bad that uh, KGB had to uh, secretly import Sears catalogs in order to figure out what kind of prices to put on all this stuff. Because you know, if you do not have uh, demand and supply, you have no idea how to how much of stuff to make. And central planning was an awesome idea that they thought because we had this new invention called paper and accounting, where we can track creation and production of everything down to the bolt. So you would say, okay, this year we need. Uh, 700 windows and for each one of those windows we need so-and-so bolts and -and so-and-so window panes and stuff and all of that would be on paper Uh, unfortunately they had no idea why they needed so many windows it was all based on demand so uh, yeah it was kind of demand driven I guess so you'd see that okay there's 700 people who need windows fixed so okay we need 700 windows Uh, we need so many bolts we need so many windows panes we would put in a requisition for all of that and all of that would be created, and there would be no waste. <clears throat> Unfortunately, what that meant is uh, your window breaks, you put in an order for a window, you can expect it sometime next year. <laughs> As opposed to you go out and buy a window. Yeah, there's another joke um, that a uh, guy comes by and he says uh, to uh, the department of management or whatever, says, so I have a uh, broken window and it needs to replace. And I said, well, this window will be ready. Uh, like this is July. And he says the window will be ready in uh, March of next year uh, on this specific date. And he says, uh, is this morning or evening? And he says, why does that matter? He says, well, I have a plumber coming that day and you should know uh, where to schedule that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <shit. clears throat> but... <laughs> What it made me realize about Marxism, like kind of a thought I had was that, yeah, the economic policy failed. So now they're talking about cultural Marxism. And I've heard about uh, right when you're talking about cultural Marxism. And I'm like, what the hell is cultural Marxism? Marxism is a, uh, it's an economic policy. Everything is central planned. Everything is, you know, owned by everybody else. But now we finally have a very good example of this cultural Marxism bullshit, which is uh, like BLM and trans rights and gay rights and all the other stuff. By the way, I am gay myself, but I, the whole thing where all the gay rights are going was uh, forcing people to bake, bake cakes and stuff is just pissing me off. Um, basically because um, I would prefer to know who the hell the bigots are because if uh, I request a cake or if I get health care from somebody I want to make sure that this cake is not going to have spit and the guy who's doing the health care is not going to be the guy who's going to do the bare minimum because he wants to be dead like I'd rather know that okay you're a bigot that's cool have your opinions I know who to avoid doing business with also what bugs me about the whole thing is that while when we were fighting for rights we were fighting like libertarians to like we want to have our own relationships. We want to have be able to have our own contracts, and we want to have our own do our own shit without you know you interfering with us. Basically, you leave us alone, let us live and love and do whatever we want. We don't want to like force our shit on you. And the fight was to get rights. At this point, is the fight is to put rights on others, which obviously is getting some pushback. But back to this cultural Marxism. Um, Yeah, we're seeing that where they're trying to uh, tie all these cultural movements to Marxist ideas for some stupid reason, even though they have absolutely nothing to do with Marxism. But it kind of made me realize recently that Marxism is actually, I mean, we knew that communist countries are typically really racist or uh, homophobic, but I never really thought about why. Uh, I thought like, well, I mean, it's just culture, it's just growing up, or it's just... uh, you know, the times or whatever. 
And yeah, in USSR, we uh, prided ourselves about being not racist. And uh, one of the government propaganda in USSR was that Soviet Union is really racist. And there's this story I remember reading as a kid in um, elementary school about this poor black boy who would have to go out every morning and shine shoes in order to earn some money. And uh, this is how bad it is for Americans. And coming here, I'm like, shit, kid was able to go out and earn some extra bucks just by shining <laughs> shoes. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, the general propaganda was that uh, America is very racist and in Soviet Union, we're not racist. In the 10 years I've lived in Soviet Union, I've seen black people twice. Most of them were foreign immigrants. There were no black people, so obviously it's very easy to not be racist. Uh, gay people were obviously uh, illegal, considered as a um, uh, mental illness, and if you were busted for being gay, you would be arrested and sent to a re-education camp or a mental institution. But then, like looking at other history, so Cubans were racist. Uh, Soviet Union was not racist officially, but was pretty freaking racist at the time and pretty anti-Semitic as well. Uh, like every communist country I look at uh, is racist uh, or bigoted. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And then it just hit me that <clears throat> under communism or collectivism in general, um, <laughs> but individualism, you put yourself above society and society works and comes together for the benefit of society, which in the market sense actually ends up being good because it's a lot more efficient and a lot cheaper and a lot more, I guess, uh, profitable, so to speak, for me to be, to work together with my neighbor than waste my money fighting on uh, everybody around me. So there's an actual profit incentive to um, come together and figure out on what everybody agrees on so that we can avoid fighting as opposed to waste money fighting each other. Collectivism and communism especially is uh, putting society above uh, individual. Unfortunately, what that means is that if you are a minority where, let's say, you're gay or trans or black or whatever, um, your personal individual rights are uh, not as important as the rights of the entire majority. So, for example, if you're a trans person and you have a, you know, that um, limited needs that communists don't support, uh, don't believe in, such as there's a limited amount of hospitals, limited amount of doctors, and as a trans person, you need a sex reassignment surgery. Unfortunately for you, that the need will be put way at the bottom of the list below everybody else who actually needs doctors to do other things. <clears throat> Same thing with, let's say you need some specific things as a gay person or you need specific things as a black person, but they're not gonna respect your culture or your needs or your wants because unfortunately your needs are below way, way on the bottom of the list uh, compared to uh, basically the entire um, society as a whole. And then uh, very quickly what happens is that uh, you demanding your personal needs, you become kind of uh, a contra state or contra culture, contra society, and you end up being oppressed, suppressed, and uh, well, basically people start hating you and eliminating you because you're not wearing great out gray outfits like everybody else, wearing the same eating the same bread like everybody else and all that kind of stuff. So recently I've just been going around on social media spreading the idea that Marxism is a very racist ideology. If I, like people start asking why, there you go, that's why. I think uh that's a great way to kind of bring all that together and tying into it. Cause yeah, for when you look at a uh, uh, Marxism today is like, <laughs> I don't think most of these people have read what's, what, uh, what Marx has read, right? Or what Engels has read. You know, if they did, they'd find a lot of very uh, racist things that uh, Marx has read in himself. Right. Um, and, but at the same time, uh, I, the way that uh, uh, the talk about culture Marxism would be that uh, the attempt to try to defeat America or the West uh, economically failed. Or a Marxist thesis that uh, inevitably capitalism will fall on its own and we just have to win. <clears throat> and capitalism didn't fall. It just kept getting better. People just keep getting richer under capitalism. Um, and so when you look at the USSR and its collapse and it couldn't beat them uh, militarily might because you have the uh, um, nuclear assert destruction, uh, you can't do it economically, uh, even trying to outspend each other. Uh, then the focus would be, well, what created the West then? 
to have this capitalistic society? What are the structures that put these uh, culture ideas together for them to, for there to be an idea of the West? And so this is where you get the Frankfurt School. This is where you get, uh, maybe it's not, maybe there still is a way to destroy capitalism, but you have to go for the pillars that help build it. And you have to go into the society structures um, uh, and in those aims. And that's why today you have attack on patriarchy, hierarchy, masculinity, uh, gender norms, uh, heteronormativity, uh, the church. Nuclear family. Right, nuclear family. Like everything has built that. Uh, they find it to be oppressive. <laughs> and so therefore, just like capitalism was an oppressor to the proletariat, now you have a different form of oppression where it's mutated. And now it's just uh, what, what is considered normal uh, for a long time. That is now um, oppressive to uh, neo-Marxists, you could say. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't call them Marxists per se. There, there would be neo marxists a different aim that they're uh, trying to bring things about and its downfall than originally what Marx was aiming for. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, like BLM, they praised uh, Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro created, uh, <laughs> my, my grandfather escaped from Cuba in a dust cropper plane. You know, he could tell you all about uh, the ills and the ways that they terrorized the family down there in Cuba and that they even built prisons to send people to, to these camps just for being gay. You know, it's not particularly a uh, gay rights activist. So oh. it's to see a lot of <clears throat> champion, <laughs> even Fidel Castro. Yeah, but- on the other hand, how many poor peasants do you know in America that have their own boats and rafts? Right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and so it's, I find the, uh, like the tie-ins from then and even now, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, I feel like it's the same kind of battlefront. You still have the same destruction of the statues that you have uh, back then during the Spanish Civil War where you had the leftist Marxists uh, shooting at right monuments of like uh, even exhuming the dead bodies of nuns so they could shoot them up again. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's always been this culture class that's been going for a long time and it's not like a, an entirely new development. Yeah. yeah and Soviet Union, Stalin uh, deployed a bunch of tanks to just go around and shoot and destroy churches and monuments and stuff too. Yeah. Right. So they find um, for them, they find God or the church to be a threat to their central power. They want to be replaced with the one that's working. Well, ironic because uh, the black community is a lot more Christian conservative than, you know, people realize. Uh, I mean, yeah, there are even, you know, like Baltimore and other really, really kind of socialist areas where uh, you'd think the black community is really socialist and they do support the housing and all the other programs and socialism and stuff. But at the same time, they are very, very, very freaking Christian. I still remember uh, when Chick-fil-A was busted for donating to uh, anti-gay organizations, everybody was all like, let's boycott Chick-fil-A and gay people like, yeah, let's boycott Chick-fil-A. And black community is like, uh, yeah, we're going to show you guys we just lined up for freaking miles down the streets just to go to Chick-fil-A to show their appreciation. <laughs> so what the, well, hell? the um, it, it's, it's weird. I think the 20th century affected black Americans and, and the Irish in a similar ways as it relates to the issue of socialism. They saw socialism as like a, a means to get out of this subjugation that they were experiencing. And I think it was like <laughs> the worst possible thing that could have happened. You know, it, they saw it as like, if we have socialism, we're protected from this economic powerhouse that's seeking to destroy us. And um, if they had only just done what they did in, say, the 1700s or, you know, earlier, that, then they, there wouldn't have been this like, oh, yeah, there's this new fangled ideology that we can use to, um, to free ourselves, to liberate ourselves. You know, it would have just been, they would have just chalked it up to capitalism freeing themselves and then they would have they would have been better off. But unfortunately, you know, we're living with the results. Um, there's a really good article by Jeffrey Tucker called The Eugenics Plot of Minimum Wage. If you guys have not read that one, uh, read it. Basically, uh, if you understand what that is talking about, and in summary, it explains um, why minimum wage was originally designed, what it was designed for, and um with some quotes about like proving that that's what the case was. 
uh, you'll kind of get the idea of what happened with all those uh, socialist programs because minimum wage in that case was designed uh, to basically eliminate undesirable kind of jobs so that undesirables, quote unquote, will not be able to get them and will be forced to either move or be broke or have no money. And then later on, it was twisted to, um, you know, support the poor or whatever. Obviously, uh, you know, you might not care about laws of economics, but the laws of economics is just going to do whatever the hell it wants. Uh, And what uh, happened in that specific stuff with minimum wage is pretty similar to what happened with all the other programs that were supposed to help. They sound like they're supposed to help out, but... Uh, I do have an economics background, by the way. I have a bachelor's in business finance and economics, and I have a master's in global econ and uh, global finance and econ. Uh, what I found in economics uh, is that a lot of times things are uh, counterintuitive. You might think that, oh, this is going to do that, and you set up policy to do that. And in the end, it ends up be doing the exact opposite, like uh, with regards to minimum wage, with regards to uh, housing programs, with a lot of stuff. So... Oh yeah, read that article. Yeah, eugenics. Uh, what did I say? Uh, the eugenics plot of minimum wage. If you get what that's going, what that's doing, and what that. I mean, if you get what the point was, and you look at the current actual outcome of that, you'll be like, well, shit. Apparently, even if we change what it's supposed to be, the outcome actually ended up being the same. And then, if you look at all the other policies, you might realize that, oh, well, you know, what they're saying is we're supposed to do that, but it comes out the other way. Uh, another thing with regards to um, cultural Marxism, by the way, uh, another realization I had, and I posted about this on Facebook, funny enough, this, well, I kind of realized that as being on the inside of the whole minority movement, but being like the part of GLB movement myself, and also being in certain unspoken tandems I shall not speak about that were totally torn up because of these kind of things. But I realized that um, one of the things that cultural Marxism, maybe cultural Marxism, but in general, this societal stuff has been pushing was that um, we are all the same. We are all equal. And that's what Marxism in general is trying to push, which is that uh, we are all equal. Men and women are equal, which bitter credit to communism. They did kind of push that forward to where uh, men and women were treated the same in the employment uh, and everything else was a terrible treatment for everybody, but at least everybody was equal. But we were equal. Like right now, they're pushing how uh, gays are equal, blacks are equal, trans are equal, everybody's equal, everybody's the same. And um, I've noticed in a lot of movies, they're also kind of pushing the same stuff too. Uh, actually, with regards to movies, I've noticed a lot of really funny things I haven't had before, which is if you look at most movies, uh, the bad guy is typically a banker or a real estate investor. If you look at all the bad guys in Scooby Doo episodes, every single one of them is a moved uh, real estate investor. I'm like, I'm a real estate investor, so now I realize it. I'm like, what the hell? So you hate but, those kids too, I take it. <laughs> yeah. No, well, Vinnie the Pooh came out. I'm like, oh, hey, Vinnie the Pooh, I read that book. Let's see what the new take on this, uh, you know, the modern thing like they did with Hook was. Let's see what that's about. Real estate investor, banker, like motherfucker. But anyway, yeah, everybody's saying how we are all equal in all these different cultures. And uh, so uh, these movies are coming out pushing kind of the same thing too. Like the movie I mentioned on my uh, uh, Facebook was Zootopia. That like, if you look at Zootopia, the general message of it is everybody's equal. All this like racism and in their case, they're fearing the... uh, uh, the meat eaters of carnivores or whatever, uh, based on just prejudices. But if you take all the animal models around and just swap them around, the movie will still work because everybody's equal. And I'm looking at these um, cultural things, and there are everybody who is extremely, let's say, SJWs or a very social kind of social Marxist type of people. They're all like, we're all equal. We're all the same. Skin color doesn't matter. The only this stuff matters. And then if you start talking facts to them, like, well, um, crime statistics say so-and-so about this specific race, or um, uh, crime statistics say so-and-so about this specific uh, sex. For example, like 
I, in this discussion on a different group, I pointed out that uh, somebody got angry at me saying, yeah, men and women are completely equal. <laughs> There's no difference between them. And that's why trans people are also equal and trans male, right, female is all equal and stuff. And I'm like, well, I mean, look at uh, crime statistics. Uh, men are a lot more like I didn't even touch the um, race thing. And I tried to kind of keep it, okay, I'm a guy, so it's okay for me to say this. Look at crime statistics. Men are a lot more prone to rape type of stuff than women. Like, because if you look at biologically type of stuff, women tend to be attracted to intellect, whereas men are more attracted to looks. It's just biological. So we look at a girl and we go, oh, that's pretty hot. And right away we start having thoughts in our head and we kind of have to be aware of that and keep that in control. But because of that, hey, that leads to, you know, there's more rape. And then if you go to any, like, online porn site, hentai site, I mean, you know, tentacle cartoons, junk like that kind of out of uh, Japan, there's a lot more tentacle rape for men than there is for women. I'm not even sure if there is any tentacle rape for women. But all of this culture that's, like, underneath, you don't even, like, talk about it. It's all taboo. Nobody discusses it. But you look at that and it's like, yeah, there's more, we're different. There's some shit there. And obviously, yeah, people bring up stuff about, um, like, yeah, there's statistics saying that there's more crime in black neighborhoods and like, what the hell's going on? But if you talk about that kind of stuff, these cultural Marxists will just get really pissed off and start attacking you. And their general stuff is, no, we're all the same. We're all equal. Problem with that is that if you start attacking this kind of stuff, saying everybody's equal, uh, you're never going to get to the underneath part of it. Like, sure, there's, I mean, like the discussion of, yeah, there's more crime in black neighborhoods. Why is that happening? And that might be happening because there's all these policies and laws that are, you know, destroying their opportunities and segregating them into these communities and then creating, uh, forcing them to, uh, resort to these businesses that might not be like there might be gray market and then the police come in and start destroying this stuff and then it perpetuates all this stuff and like the discussion of why all this happens can never even happen because you know we have to all believe that we're all equal as opposed to right. realizing that we are actually yeah. different it's the it, <clears throat> the frustrating thing is to try to talk to somebody and explain that i don't think the cops are necessarily racist i think and, and, and even if the outcome is bad for a lot of inner city blacks, I do think that inner city blacks are placed into this situation that, that the government has created for them, you know, the war on drugs, welfare state projects, all this crap. And of course, that's why they're, you know, they're, they're, they get to be in this horrible situation and then the cops just get to be sicked on them because the only uh, lucrative thing, right. uh, job opportunity they have is, you know, selling Selling drugs or as adults, we are able to discuss this. As children, they're not. And the way that this ties back to this whole cultural Marxism stuff, uh, we understand that people have different levels of skills, different levels of motivation, different levels of intellect. Uh, I mean, some people are smarter than other people. Like it was easier for me to understand stuff than it was for my friends, for example. And we're open about this. And that's what leads people to different outcomes, uh, different uh, levels of income, different achievement. Cause I mean, uh, some people are willing to take massive risks and bust their butts. And some people don't want to take the risk and want to spend at home, just, you know, watching TV, going to work, self, so having somebody tell them what to do. And as a result, we have, we are, we are different. We have different outcomes. The same deal was here. We have <clears throat> people from different cultures, people with different interests, people with different races, and they have their own different cultures, different interests, different needs. But that's capitalism. Under Marxism, everybody's supposed to be equal. The outcomes are supposed to be equal. If you're white or you're black or you're gay or you're straight, uh, what you get out of your life, your culture, everything is supposed to be equal. If you're different, they shut you down really fast. Right. I think um, like my thought about a lot of this is particularly like why do they advocate for uh, equality of outcomes, for example? Uh, what do they advocate for Marxism today? And I think it might be as a result of making a lot of poor choices in life. Uh, you can say loser choices in life and getting that worthless degree in college and you're still, uh, you know, back cook, uh, dishwasher cleaner, you know, at age 40. Uh, I think a lot of poor choices in life and it's very difficult for them to kind of look at themselves and say, you know what, maybe I should have made different choices, but they're kind of 
dug in heel uh, and feel like they have to go all the way. And perhaps they think just maybe if we overthrow the system, my life and my lot and what I've not amassed much might improve uh, in that state better in this state. Um, yeah, and nobody, nobody's equal to one another. I'm not, uh, I'm a fast runner, but I'm pretty sure, but I, I ran against Kurt. Kurt is pretty fast and is in his sprints. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you look at, um, you look at it. I think the, the reason why they want to say everything is equal, I think it's another attempt to kind of discredit Western culture and Western civilization. Uh, all you have to do is just go to the Middle East and find how different or how equal do you think, uh, things are there, especially for gay rights in the Middle East. Uh, do you think uh, places there, do they play uh, SpongeBob? Do they reveal on the news there that SpongeBob was gay? No, they would throw SpongeBob off the roof in the Middle East. Stupid. Right. That yeah. whole SpongeBob was gay was like so pandering. I mean, they, <laughs> I don't even like SpongeBob. I don't watch SpongeBob. I think I, but supposedly from what I'm told, canonically, he's supposed to be asexual or whatever. Cause he's a sponge. They reproduce by just dividing. <laughs> but it's like, Hey, yeah. Uh, hey, it's uh, what should we call it? Gay pride months or whatever. Uh, let's get some more clicks and views. SpongeBob is gay. Like what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, but I think that's their way to discredit it. They don't want to say that all over yeah. Well, it's like, no, I mean, uh, people have a much better uh, standard of life than majority Christian countries and Western countries than they do in other pro-majority Muslim or Islamic countries uh, where you have to watch what you say. Here, you can be an atheist, sure, and say what you want. There, good luck, right? Uh, hopefully you don't disappear. Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of what it is. Another way to kind of discredit and trying to say everything's equal and trying to, um, again, uh, destroy Western civilization. Um, so that's, I just want to say real quick that I think this is part of your capitalist supremacy thinking, uh, you're having economic mindset, like you're comparing things to each other. That's wrong. You can't do that. You can't compare things to each other. They have to be equal. Right. Yeah. And that's one thing that even Thomas Sala says, like, and for anything, for any, anything that leftist brings up, ask him compared to what? <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Classic economic question. <clears throat> right. How's your wife doing compared to what? <laughs> I think I heard first heard that from Walter Block. I yep. Think I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to go into Bitcoin, but we're approaching almost the hour. We're just going to have to come back and bring you on the show again. And this next time, just do nothing but Bitcoin and then lay down all the hardest questions we can think. Uh, cause he did a great job. What well, at Anarchon last year, he was the vaudevillian <laughs> being anti-Bitcoin, almost convinced. <laughs> uh, to help the pro Bitcoin guy out too. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, that's, that's another way out of, you can say this status madness, uh, away from fiat currency and socialized currency and the way how it brought down, uh, USSR. And you know, this is something, a testament of um, the Mises Institute and carry on uh, the economic calculation problem in that inevitably the U.S. government will fall into the same fate. And you can't print your money out of those kinds of problems. But Bitcoin is an interesting, great alternative uh, solution to the problem we face with that. Um, yeah, I think Bitcoin is probably our only solution to a uh, problem with socialism. Unfortunately, uh, that. Bitcoin needs to be a little more anonymous and a little better at tax avoidance for that to happen. <clears throat> right. Yeah. I pay my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with corporate structuring, my, ta my income and taxes are zero this year. So there you go. And that's legally zero. We'll need to talk later after the show. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, any last uh, questions you guys have for uh, Michael regarding Marxism? Kurt. Um, I mean, I guess, would you think, I, I've heard that, uh, Marx is the one who coined the term capitalism. So do you have any, do you have any reservations? So the word capitalism, do you like, I personally just call myself a market anarchist or whatever. I don't know. What uh, feeling, I don't so. think he did. I hear that brought up a lot, but then somebody else brought up that somebody way before that came up with the word capitalism before you did. So. But it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, if somebody comes up with a word and it's a really good idea, sure. I, mean, I like capital and I would fly capitalism. Yeah. Doesn't matter. <laughs> um, honestly, I'm kind of sick of 
um, the, uh, the, the socialists and collectivists appropriating words and then us having to come up with different words and then they appropriate that word and then we have to come up with a different word. Like, no, fuck you. We're going to keep this word. I'm a, like, I'm a capitalist. Does that offend you? Good. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um. <laughs> capitalist power. Uh, I like it. Great uh, writer came out of that notorious place was also Ayn Rand and, you know, notorious uh, champion for capitalism. Uh, and it's interesting the parallels for people that escape from there, like yourself, uh, and champion the cause and see the horrors of Marxism. And hopefully uh, things don't go into the same direction in this place. I think we have a lot more pro-minded capitalists. I don't, I don't think the whole place is kind of like brainwashed and kind of uh, drowning in a sea of Marxist thoughts or... What are you My parents are Republicans and they're really pro-Trump because they're really worried about what's going on with this whole statue being torn down and the uprising and the BLM. And I'm like, I'm not going to vote. I'm like, but you have to vote because that'll, you know, we have to, uh, even if you don't support them, at least it'll be some way to stop them. And I think the best uh, comeback to our country going to this shit and people saying, please do something is who's John Galt. Fuck it. <laughs> Uh, I, at this point, like, I don't know. I don't think, honestly, I don't think we can stop it. The best we can do is just, uh, position ourselves to be not affected by this stuff. Right. Disregard the state, acquire capital. And that's next topic, Bitcoin. That's what that's all about. (laughs) With those watching, stay liberated. Get off my property. You can vote your way into socialism, but you have to shoot your way out. (laughs) 